Hello. I can't hear you, Art. I can't, I can't, I can't hear you. I don't know if you can hear me. I, I, you're back in California. And you just got back in California. But I still can't hear you. So you still got, you've still got something going on. Oh, wait, your microphone is muted. Can you hear me now? There we go. Your mic was muted. Okay. So can you hear me okay? <laughs> yeah. Long... Yeah, you sound great. Okay, I must be picking it up off the speaker off of my uh, camera. Because I've got earphones and I'm hearing you in my earphones. Okay. But the only other microphone I have active right now is the one that's built into the camera. Into the camera. It pro probably is. That's probably what's going on. Yeah. So we basically just got off a plane uh, an hour and a half ago, two hours ago. Wow. Just got to the house uh, half an hour ago, and we're in the process, I'm in the process of putting back together my office. Uh, <laughs> and I'm, I'm surprised you actually even took time to, for the meeting. <laughs> well, I mean... That's, couple that's... Of things I want, a couple of things I wanted to mention, uh, uh, specifically regarding the, um, the uh, RTL uh, 433. So I'll wait till some of the other guys are here and I'll talk about it a little bit. Yeah, Jim, Jim uh, was late sending out the announcement today, so... We'll see well, how that goes. I haven't seen anything today. I, you know, I spent the whole day either in airports or on a uh, plane. So, right. so we're just getting our feet on the ground. Came home and found uh, three cars with dead batteries. So uh, we'll, we'll have to sort that out. Yeah, but it's been like, like almost a year since you were over here driving them so well no seven and a half months yeah seven and a half months yeah but on the other hand we don't get that cold weather so i think this is just as a result of the normal drainage that happens on every car for the things that don't turn off when you right. shut off the ignition yeah the and, clock and all that kind of stuff and not and driving not very much current right but over seven months, it, you know, yeah, so forth and so on. Yeah. So at any rate, uh, we, I got to get that stuff going. And, uh, that shouldn't be too hard. Get, bottom get line done. is, uh, I think last week I mentioned that I had bought this uh, wireless um, uh, 433.5. 9.2 megahertz 
pulse wave, low energy, mailbox notification thing. And that unfortunately of all of the drivers that they have in the RTL dash 433, um, none of them seem to work. Well, it turns out I was wrong. <laughs> okay. It turns out that there are certain projects that get started. Uh, Somebody starts to write a driver and they get to a certain point and either get stuck or something else interferes with life or whatever. And the one that decodes the mailbox notification thing was one of those categories. So what happens is I can detect that signal. So when the, when the mailbox door gets open and closed, I can detect that 433 megahertz signal, but uh, the data it gives me just tells me that the, the thing has been flipped open and flipped shut because it's got a bunch of other stuff like temperature and humidity and a bunch of other bells and whistles. And they are, <laughs> the data is bogus, let me put it that way. So it's obvious to me, whoever was working on this project either is still working on it or has given up on it or whatever. But it turns out if you go through the, the uncompiled list of drivers, see this whole thing is built on GitHub. Mm -hmm. There have been a whole bunch of people involved in it. And if you go through them, in all the list of drivers, if it has an asterisk next to it, that means it is blacklisted for whatever reason. Either it doesn't work at all, or it breaks something, or it's a working process. So there's a subset of these um, 183 current drivers that are not real, are not live, or not ready for prime time, or however you want to put it. However, this one detects my mailbox. And it does a very good job. And by the way, this thing does a terrific job with the little enunciator I have in my house. Only problem is my arm's not long enough to hit the reset button from here and frame out. Okay. And that is one feature of the enunciator that, uh, frankly, I would change if I were designing it. Whereas you've got to go. Every time you, you the, the enunciator works and you go get your mail, you've then got to go back in the house and push the reset button. Yeah. And it works fine for the next time. But if you don't push the reset button, it doesn't work at all. So, Henry, so I highly recommend these 433. Uh, megahertz uh, devices because they run on zilch uh, power. In other words, they will essentially work uh, for the shelf life of the battery to draw very little current. And I'm currently able to see I have in I haven't set one up here yet, but I currently in um, Milford, I'm able to see four of my temperature sensors and that, and three of them I think are temper, temperature and humidity. And the fourth one is temperature only. And I'm able to see tons of these TPMSs. I, 
I'm beginning to wonder if I'm picking them up off the freeway, which is about a mile away, but it's, we sit on the top of a hill. Yeah. And we have a line of sight to the freeway. So I don't know how, if it would carry that far or not. But we also have a number of devices in the neighborhood that I think are probably other people's stuff. Some of which I can identify, not the person, but the type of stuff. In other words, there's some other temperature sensors and so forth and so on. So, so it's, it's really been an interesting study and I've gone through the code backwards and forwards. I mean, there, this is, this is probably a, some place between a 10 and 20,000 line code project. It's a pretty good sized project. Fortunately, it's been done by a whole bunch of people and the, the drivers alone, uh, each of those drivers probably has a couple of hundred lines of code and there's 183 of those. So uh, you can see a lot of interest in this. And what it's motivating me to do is buy myself one of these Accurite weather stations that has an anemometer on it, rain gauge, uh, temperature gauge, um, what else? They have a lightning gauge and so forth and so on because all of that is communicated at this 433 megahertz. So at any rate, this project is obviously going to keep me for a while, <laughs> going to keep me out of, uh, out of uh, trouble for quite a while. <laughs> so at any rate, I'm back in Fremont. We arrived at the house about a half an hour ago. And I'm in the process of trying to uh, de-scramble everything I scrambled before I left seven and a half months ago. So there's a lot of stuff I just pulled out and tossed in the box and took with me to Milford. And, you know, uh, so I've got a, a lot of loose ends here. So at any rate, that's the story. Well, you heard it live from Fremont, California. <laughs> well, and, and, and more people showed up in the middle of your story. <laughs> yeah. We got Jim now and Vicente and Mike and Kenny. Hi. Uh, I don't see Mike and Kenny. Okay. So I got nothing about this story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you came in right at the end of the story. Yeah. Well, this is, Vicente, this is my work with the 433 megahertz um, SDR dongle. Okay. It allows me to, to interpret all of these devices that run at 433 okay. megahertz. Then there's a lot of, a lot of weather station stuff a lot of tire pressure monitoring stuff in case you want to monitor that. And a lot of security stuff. My, my um, ADT security system in Milford has, I don't know, 30 or 40 uh, different codes. And each one of them appears to be attached to uh, a window or a door opener or a motion detector or something like that. So not only can I gather, keep track of all the codes, but if I want to go through tediously and figure out which thing is which thing, I could actually keep track of it that way. So oh, it anyway, looks, looks, looks interesting. I'm sorry? It looks interesting. Is, is 433? Mega, megahertz. 
Uh, what's the, the, uh, official, the official frequency is 433.92 megahertz, yes. And you can record yeah. and, and, and analyze the, the data after? You are recording or something with the... Yeah. With your... Yes, yes. What I'm doing is I've got a, an SDR dongle set up. Okay. And I've got it tuned to 433 megahertz. And every time a packet comes through, the packet gets captured. And when the capture, packet is captured, then if it's one of the 183 uh, things that have been decoded, uh, somebody's worked their way through and built a driver for it. Wow. Then I can, I can decode it. You have you have a link. So you have a link for the, your dongle. Your, your tool. Yeah, the I can I can I can put one up. It's okay. It's just an then, Amazon. Do it later. Okay, you can put it in the in the screen, in the share. In the chat. Chat. Yeah. Let me let me let me um, let me grab the. But the key point is not the dongle. You can probably take any inexpensive dongle and use it. Mm -hmm. The key point is so, several different software packages okay. that have been developed to decode these various things. So if you've got Scramble. one controlling, I'm sorry? Well, on a scramble, all, all the information, well, decoding everything. Right, yeah. exactly. It will decode all these. And it turns out the guys that are using this 433 megahertz are doing for one reason, basically, is to <coughs> put in de devices where you have very low energy usage. It's cheap. So in other words, you can- Yeah, it's cheap. You can, well, they're cheap also. Yeah, and legal. But, the, but they're, they're cheap to build. But the other part of the story is that the batteries will run for the shelf life of the battery. There, there are micro amps being drawn out of the battery. And since on average, it uh, doesn't use much energy because it just spits out these packets of pulses. The catch is decoding them. Okay. And that's what this RTL uh, 433 uh, which you can find on GitHub, by the way. This is the frequency for so, uh, garage doors. Is the same of the other garage door? Is the same frequency used for garage uh, doors opener? Or yeah, is, the, is this frequency okay? Would you like to be able to send there are, your there are, own four thirty three messages? Say again. Would you like to be able to send your own your own messages, create and read your own messages, or create oh, and send? Oh yeah, you can do that. Yeah, you there's can do a that because you there's an article. You on buy that. It. Yeah, there's a bunch of uh, YouTube articles on that, but you can buy. Yeah. You you can buy both the transmitters and the receivers, and then make a complete connection. What I'm doing now is just grabbing packets from devices in my environment and using them. One of the, I'm kind of a metrology bug, so I have a lot of temperature measurement devices, motion detector devices, and rain gauges and so forth and so on. They all operate on batteries and they all send this, this proprietary pulse stream 
to some sort of a base station. So for example, my rain gauge has a, a little tilted bucket thing that sits out on my back fence. And in my house, I have a, um, a reader and it keeps track of the number of inches of rain I've had. But the problem is the reader doesn't share. If you <laughs> one way of putting it, the only way I've gotten it to share is I take one of my wife's cameras and point it at the reader and I can then remotely read what the amount of rain is. Well, that that classifies as a kludge, all right? What I really want to do is gather those rain gauge readings and store them in a file someplace. And that's what I've started doing. I've started gathering the pulse streams from my rain gauge and storing it in a file where I can plot the amount of rain per day and so forth and so on. Uh, here in California, that's kind of academic these days, but um, uh, in Milford, it was quite handy. And I can do the same thing for all my temperature gauges. The key thing is that all of the people who are building these 433 megahertz devices feel motivated to set up their own proprietary protocol. So there is no standard protocol. So you've got to basically take a scope. You got to capture the pulse stream, decode it. In other words, I know 40 inches of rain equals this pulse stream. I know 35 inches of rain equals this pulse stream. And then I have to take that and decode it. Well, this RTL-433 uh, software package, it's open source, uh, is a bunch of guys doing exactly that. And they've done rain gauges and they've done tire pressure yes. monitors and they've done uh, temperature and motion and whatever. Oh, the key till. feature. Six. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll mute him. I think I think he's over there talking to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> um anyway, that's the story of his one too. Interesting, interesting. I like so I'm it. Gonna, I'm gonna, I'll put up the links. Yeah. Uh, as Leroy has pointed out, I, 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 there I like, are a lot, a lot of cheap SDR radios. I, I, I like to see your updates about that in next weeks because it's, it's very interesting. I like it. Go to go to the forum. Okay. Go to the forum. There's a whole post about all the all the SDR radios. Okay. The four of them that I've got, one of them's very, very close to what Art's okay. got, yeah. or very, very similar. And I'll put up the link to the 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 SDR dongle I bought was just straight out of Amazon. I I didn't I just. Read, there's a lot of them, and I just read them exhaustively until I found one that had a minimum number of complaints. Okay. A lot of reviews and a minimum number of complaints. Right, right. So Nothing you, is bulletproof to just complaints. I mean, yeah. guys will yeah. complain about yeah, the fact everything. that, about you, know, <laughs> you know, uh, it came in a pink box. It should have been a green box. I mean, it's just amazing. Yeah. 
<laughs> but you, you know, you can call through those reviews and get them, eliminate the ones that are written by idiots <laughs> and uh, you get a pretty good review. And so I, that's what I did. I went through a bunch of them and I picked out this one. And I said, now, what the hell? I mean, I'm in, what am I risking? 40 bucks for a dongle <coughs> and a couple of uh, antennas. antennas and cables to connect to it. You know, I, I've made 40 buck mistakes before, let me tell you. Uh, <laughs> You need to ask. You need to ask. You need to ask Leroy about that. Yeah. I, so I figured, hey, it's worth a risk. Besides which, if it doesn't work, I got three days to send it back to Amazon. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> that's, that's one. But as it turned out, it worked beautifully. And I've used it for other things. I've used it to listen for. Uh, what was it you and I were doing, Leroy? The, uh, Air traffic the, control, uh, or no, not air traffic control. Uh, just the airplanes, just planes in general, watching the planes. It, it, it's basically a transponder. Other yeah, on the, you're watching the I transponders. What, what, what frequency? I've also listened. Uh, that those are those are. Uh, Ten ninety on their megahertz. Uh, ten ten. No no. 10 megahertz? 1090 megahertz. 1090 megahertz? 1.0990 1 gigahertz. But the dongle I've got will go, uh, I think stock, it goes from like a couple of hundred megahertz to uh, just under two gigahertz. But you can actually tweak around with it a little bit and you can get it to go down to uh, way below the broadcast band, down to down in the 160 meter stuff. Uh, yeah. But the, it's really handy. If you want to do some radio experimentation, get yourself an SDR dongle. I will. It is just a, a decent I, I, one. <laughs> And, and you don't have to spend a lot of money for that, it. You do not have to spend a lot of money. And there are a lot of different software tools for using it. Uh, you said I create a protocol for the the distance measurement ultrasonic using for 433 uh, megahertz, I think. But I create my own protocol also. As you said, everyone is. Really? Yeah. To, to trigger the, the ultrasonic uh, sender. So I can check how it's working with this tool, I, I guess. I think, it's, I think it's a matter of pride that all engineers feel yeah. they should make yeah. at least one proprietary to create a call. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's true. Some kind of pride. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> only, only you understand that. <laughs> so, anyway, no, uh, and 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 to Jim's question, you know, I found the bag of four thirty three megahertz transmitters and receivers, and I think there were eight of them in the bag. Yeah. Eight each, eight transmitters, mm -hmm. eight receivers, and I'm pretty sure that bag cost me under ten bucks. So, yeah, you know, there. If you want to do some experiment, experimenting with four thirty three, it's easy. By the way, that's also the frequency that is used for. Your car keys, you know, when you push the button to unlock your car and so forth and so on, uh, they use the same technique there. Now, 
it's not a fixed code. Yes, they put uh, a rotating, rotating code in it. So you can't just do a reef play. Uh, in other words, if a code was fixed, all you'd have to do is sit there someplace and record the door open code while some guy was un, uh, unlocking his door. And then when he's gone, replay it again. Well, obviously for things that are important, like unlocking your car, uh, they have to come up with something that gets around that. And they use a rotating code. It's not a fixed code. So. Hey, anyway, Ray, those are my adventures for the week. That and getting back to Fremont. Are you back to Fremont? Does this look the same as my desk in uh, in Milford? Well, it could be a background you're projecting. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I don't think. I don't think. You have, you have a, blue, a, blue, a blue screen and you are, you are faking your, your location. No, I, I got to tell you, that's the real, that's the real stuff. I can go knock some stuff off a shelf for you. Okay. Now, this is, this is my uh, um, somewhat uh, disorganized uh, office in Fremont, California. Yeah. Well, it, it doesn't... Which is even more disorganized because when I was getting ready to go to Milford, I was grabbing parts and so forth and so on, stuffing them in a box to, to get out the door. So it is actually in a worse state than it usually is. <laughs> and I now got to go back and undo all that and figure out what it uh, what it, uh, how it should go back together. I am in a constant flux between file by pile and file by layer. <laughs> so it, it doesn't matter where I am or when I am doing it. it it's, it's still the same. So, so my, my desk well, over the week gets piled up with stuff and then Thursday, I have to clear it off to <laughs> to make sure that there's a nice background. <laughs> well, I have, I have two things uh, I'd like to mention. Uh, you, you probably all remember that Julie and I pick things up that people have thrown out. Uh, we picked up a tote of women's wigs, for example, $12,000 worth of women's wigs. That went to the wig boutique. Oh, really? Women undergoing cancer treatment, and so it it's not unusual for us to donate stuff we find or whatever. But we found a box about three or four years ago, and in the bottom of it was a class ring, and the woman's name was engraved on the inside of it. And I tried at the time we found it to locate this woman through the high school and through a, a, a white pages search. And I wasn't able to. So Julie found it in her desk drawer the other day and managed to find the owner of this ring who had lost it 27 years ago. Wow. Wow. And Man. I would send her a copy of her high school diploma to prove that it was the right person because she was now going by a different last name and a different first name. I thought just wow. amazing that, that you would take a ring and it would recouple with the uh, the person that lost it yeah, yeah. Wow. that yeah. much time. I mean, even if you lost it yesterday, coupling it up with the right person would be I, I thought it was, it was pretty impressive. Well, how, how did you know what high school it was? 
it had it on the on the ring around the bezel. It was a Lakota High School and D. Russell Lee in 1993. And then the woman's name was uh, engraved on the inside of it. Now, how Julie cu coupled up and found her, that's a different story altogether. It's beyond my, my ability to recall that. <clears throat> the second item, and it goes back to what you were saying about weather art. And that is, um, we have digitized photographs from our families going back 110 years. And whenever possible, we've identified the people that were in those photographs and the date. In Kansas City, we had a number of photographs that were obviously taken on Easter but we did not know what year. Someone had compiled a hundred years of the weather on Easter in Kansas City, and we were able to find that online and look at the photograph and said, well, that's too cold for, there weren't too many clothes for 70, 78 degrees or whatever. And so we were able to go through and identify most of the Easter photos because somebody had a hundred years worth of meteorological data <laughs> Easter's in Kansas City. Where'd you get, where'd you get the original photos from? Uh, when my mom passed away, she, had, she left us a box of photographic negatives. And that was like, 16,000 photos. And uh -huh. so we went through and scanned those in. And then since then, we have uh, scanned in uh, slides, other negatives, and photographs. So we're, I think we're at about 27,000 photographs or so now in the, in the database. One of the, one of the, things that Julie and I still laugh about is a, is a picture of a little kid, he's old, like five or six, wearing bibs. And when you turn the photograph over, it says, anybody know who this kid is? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, the last person to know who that kid was, was probably died a hundred years ago. <laughs> but anyway, that, that's a different, a different issue. That's where the, the photographs came, came in. Uh, we had purchased a photographic slide scanner and we could do about 200 a day with a slide scanner. And we traded that around between family members and such because uh, professional slide scanning is expensive it's between a dime and a quarter a piece yeah and what brand did you get uh i don't remember the the nikon were out of our price range and i i'm thinking this was something like olympic but i don't really remember it's been many years ago and then we prorated, uh, we sold it, and I thought we were going to sell it at a profit because the prices had gone up. But when you deducted uh, UPS shipping and uh, uh, fees for uh, PayPal and fees for eBay, it cost us, I think, like point triple zero one cents per, per slide that we had scanned in. And we just kept track of uh, everybody who used it, how many photo or how many uh, slides had scanned in, and then uh, uh, prorated it. So I think it cost me a dollar forty to scan in all the slides that I had. No, this was black and white or color, or both. Color slides. Um, if we had been able to separate the ectochrome from the Kodachrome the slide scanner had a utility that would have done a better job 
of removing dirt and uh, noise and stuff. But I had no way of doing anything other than guessing what was ectochrome, what was kodachrome, because almost all of these were. Um, well, it's easy if you just if you're willing to demount the slides. Because if you demount the slides, you can see along. There's a logo along the edge of it. But if you don't want to damage the slide, then you're probably out of luck. Well, this was not just Kodak film, though. It was across the range. So if we got uh, a Fuji film, for example, I wouldn't know what that would be equivalent to. Uh, so we we uh -huh. don't have. We didn't let the, the computer go through and do the best job it could have of eliminating uh, dust and stuff. It was a, had an infrared capability for doing that. But again, that, that's been years ago that we were able to go through and, and do that. That's uh, when a year ago, that's that's what dad was doing down at the library oh, really yeah actually he was they were uh digitalizing all of uh, uh thousands of archives worth of uh, george c kraut's stuff and some of it was uh you know really good about telling where it was at and who was in the photograph and whatever made dad's job really easy and others of it were, I don't know where this is. I don't know what this is. <laughs> and um, we would go out and we would drive around Middletown looking to, to see if we could find any of the landmarks in some of these pictures. Because some of them were uh, just, they were bad. And, and nobody put a date on them or anything. It was just, yeah. And so. Well, uh, the uh, uh, Microsoft no longer supports it, but Photo Gallery Live has facial recognition built into it. Mm. It's one of the reasons I keep Windows 7 on this machine is so that we can go back and do facial recognition. And uh, it gets mistakes. Uh, a large black man showed up with my mom's name on it. And it's like, well, no, that, that's not my right. mom was never a large black man. I, uh, my two granddaughters, one's uh, seven and one's five, and they look an awful lot alike, and the facial recognition is always confusing the two. It always says one is the other or, or, or whatever, and I'm like, yeah, close enough, whatever. <laughs> at least <laughs> at least it identifies them as grandkids, <laughs> sticks them in the grandkid folder. But uh, it, it's usually wrong. It's usually, I get, you, you know, from, from uh, Google Photos, you get the, the little clips that they make for you, the memory clips. And one will be something about tea and you'll be watching it. And all of a sudden, Lulu will show up and you're like, yeah, I get it. <laughs> but that's the, that's the facial wreck doing that. Well, photo recognition um, will pick out, if you have a, a photograph on the mantle, for example, it's sophisticated enough, it will, it will look at that person on the photograph of the mantle and come up with who, who that photograph really is. Yeah. Well, yeah, but Dad, Dad when he was uh, working down at the library, that's what he was doing. All, almost all his stuff is... Uh, in the digital archives on on the library's website a lot of his stuff is there and then he he puts when he doesn't know something he'll put i don't know contact me if you know <laughs> this was all people's pictures um george kraut was basically the the historian for middletown for a thousand years I, and he collected hundreds of thousands of pictures. Some of them were his and some of them were other people's. His were- In a minute, one minute. 
Yep, we're 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 running, running low. His pictures, most of his pictures that he took himself were identified because that's what he did. He archived stuff. Pictures that people gave him, not so much. So, but he had there. There's hundreds of thousands, and they're not even close to being done doing it. So, all right. We're uh, we're at 15 seconds, so I'll start the next meeting here in a in a couple seconds and see everybody over there. All right, time to go fix some dinner. <laughs> hey, Barry, you're looking good, man. <laughs> All right.